Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Phoenix Film Revival Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Iannacone. And today I have with me Stacey Iannacone, my wife, and uh, our special guest, Dave Dupree. Um, we've met Dave Dupree a while back through the photo community. And uh, we're excited to chat with him about his past with film photography and uh, his uh, career in art and all of that stuff. Yeah, in general. So, um, so yeah, Dave, um, thank you so much for being on the on the podcast with us. Oh yeah, what a great honor! And, uh, this is quite fun. Awesome. Yeah, we're under the the red lights here in the dark room today. The we condos. are. Yeah, we're, we're in the we're, theme. That's it. We're, we're <laughs> coming to you live from uh, the dark room here at the <laughs> Film Revival. Mm-hmm. Yep. Located in uh, the historic Grand Avenue Arts District. Yeah. So, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you live here in the, the Arts District as well. Yeah, just a five, eight minute walk down from... Not too bad. There's a lot the, of artists down there too on that end. That's uh, the... Uh, what's the name of the plaza? I'm it's uh, Oasis on Oasis. Grand. Mm-hmm. Oasis on Grand. Oasis on Grand. I've been there for almost 10 years. Oh, wow. Oh, awesome. So, yeah, we've seen a lot happen on Grand Avenue since 2013. Yeah, for the better? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I think <laughs> yeah. it is. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons I moved down here. Was yeah. A good friend of mine that's also another artist uh, kind of spurred me into moving here. And it, I think all of us that moved down here kind of envisioned what was going to happen with Grand Avenue. Not to what we've seen now, but, you know, knew it was going to become the next up and coming kind of place. Yeah. Especially with everything that's kind of gone on over on uh, Roosevelt Row with all the new... Yeah, that's really changed in the oh, last yeah. 10 years radically. Um, yeah, it's amazing to see how, how I remember there being a, a dozen food trucks that would pull into a semicircle onto a dirt lot during First Friday, and you can go get whatever food you want and then wander and see all these uh, this uh, art on the street. And it's mm-hmm. changed quite a bit. <laughs> the galleries and all the pop up uh, yep. container gallery little spaces and everything, you know. Um, yeah, it's really changed now with, you know, lack of galleries. It's all changed. It's just yeah. uh, changed a lot. I guess they call it gentrification, whatever, you know. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's been sparked by the universities and such, uh, which yeah. is understandable. So, yeah, there's pros and, pros and cons, but, you know, change is inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Grand Avenue continues and hopefully picks up a bit more. So, slowly but surely. Yeah. I think it will. It's kind of a diverse, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an unusual little strip of, um, I'm not sure that we'll see whatever happened on Grand, on Roosevelt Row here on Grand Avenue, but there's a different set of businesses here. Yeah. And um, we're getting more nightlife, which is what draws the crowds down. Yeah, and food. Right. So we yeah. got Chilte right. just opened, and then Baconora is open now, and then there's obviously some great uh, coffee shops. Just yeah, and I haven't I haven't been down here to the one um, that's down. Chil- Chilte is that is that the uh, at the what is it there, Safari or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, they're at um, the Egyptian uh, Hotel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. the um, uh, that restaurant's really good. I have a friend who works there, and I think it's a five star restaurant or four or five star Michelin. That's what I've so, heard. Yeah, yeah. The is... um, they started as a food truck, and then um, they've been uh, trying to open for the longest time, and they finally opened up that that space there, and now they're they're doing their thing. Um. But they seem to be doing well. Every time I drive by, they seem like they're busy. So that's great. That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. But food always brings people into the area. So we're it, hoping, it, you know. It does. And that's kind of the interesting thing about when you have galleries, you think, well, that's going to draw. No, you have to have the you have to have the other. Yep. And then that draws the crowds in that then come into the gallery spaces and the creative spaces and such. Too. Yep. So it is, it's an interplay between both of them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So Hopefully we can get some more events here it's been a little little slow on first fries now we're in the middle of summer <laughs> yeah uh, not yeah. super hot out yet but certainly if fall, fall comes around hopefully we can do a few events i know we're planning on a big uh, halloween party here 
Yep. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah, we want to do something right Yeah, October's, a, that, that's the big kickoff right there mm-hmm. for each year down here. Maybe Stranger Things will come back and then we can do it Stranger Things themed. There we go. Or something like that. <laughs> the upside dark room down. The upside dark room down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stranger <laughs> Things is fun because you actually see a dark room and there's like, if you go online, their kids are like, why is he in that red room? <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, yeah it's life. fun to see like mm. that, the dark room stuff and like modern day stuff so the kids are like what is that right yeah oh yeah no that's quite true that's makes quite sense true. they haven't they haven't been exposed at all that's been i mean it seems like even digital cameras at this point are kind of not a thing <laughs> for a lot of kids it's just all phone yeah the phones have gotten so good there's a, a brief pickup in uh, vintage digital yeah that's, that's been a bit of a trend now so people are looking for kind of like the potato digital cameras that you know three megapixel yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the ones that we started with yeah which yeah. they do have a look that's for sure like might not be a great look but it's interesting i mean if you're going for some sort of interesting aesthetic yeah know, sometimes that'll be out yeah well, finding those cameras is hard now too like if you look around people are buying them up it's yeah. the next thing i think yeah 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 well you know it's like anything i think as as photographers we take the equipment we have and the processes we're working with and uh, exploit those. Mm -hmm. You know, they all have their limitations. Every process has a limitation to it somewhere. Every piece of equipment, whether it's four by five, eight by 10, on down to the smallest, uh, I don't don't think they make them anymore, but the old 110s. Yep. And I can remember back, there was a photographer that was on the East Coast. This was probably in the 80s uh, that was taking 110 film and then enlarging it up to massive prints, <laughs> wow. uh, which were making them very similar to like pointillism, kind of like yeah. expression, you know, that whole oh, yeah. time period. in Because in, uh, you did, you had all the, uh, the color dots from, yeah. the, from the grain. Yeah, and the color film, so it was. Uh, it was that quite probably interesting. looked pretty cool, actually. It was. Yeah. I have to see that, I have to look that up. If you get it in focus, I mean, as long as you have that focus, you're still going to get definition from the, the film itself, which is yeah. awesome. Right, and the further you s- stepped away from the images, because um, they were mural size. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. probably six, seven feet in height. Yeah, and um, you'd step back, and that's when you'd start to the, everything would come together. Yeah, yeah. The closer you get, it just becomes a big blur. S- squints, yeah. squints a little, and mm-hmm. it comes into focus. It's a schooner. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the ideal size, like for a one ten film, like the largest in theory that I you're think supposed it's to go, like for four by case. six, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Which is so I think small. it's half of that. I think it's like, oh, it's very small. Yeah, it's so small. Yeah, yeah like that film is just so tiny. Three, three inch basically yeah what yeah. were people Prime. using that film primarily for when 110 came out i mean beyond because i don't see it a was lot the of... it was really kind of the minox i think it was a spinoff of uh you know the spy cameras yes yeah. so it was it was yeah. definitely it was novelty even when it came out well 110 yeah. film is actually eight millimeter film mm-hmm. so it was repurposed in that format mm-hmm. um um uh, size wise mm-hmm. so eight millimeter uh motion picture film um it matches up to the 110. Yeah. So, um, a teeny, teeny, tiny camera. But yeah, I mean, I think it was just more of a, um, it came on later as more of a commercialized way of doing something more compact, but yeah. um, easier to carry with you, sort of thing. But uh, well, it was know. literally a pocket camera. That's yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. You know, because it was the ones that I, I still got one actually has a roll of film sitting in it. Yeah. Just for novelty. <laughs> yeah do they even make reels for that to develop i don't think so no i don't think so yeah. i mean you have to you could send it in darkroom the darkroom.com does the developing for 110 still um hmm. i think tempe camera might i don't recall it's been a while since i've asked them but um there's a few places that still develop that film yeah. so but uh yeah speaking of film and that's why we're here (laughs) so dave um you've got quite a bit of history with uh, photography um and we would love to hear it yeah (laughs) so tell us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh who's who's dave dupree (laughs) (laughs) um yeah i've got almost half a century in uh in a career with photography i started in about 1977 prescott arizona 
In fact, I probably would not have started in photography had I not moved to Prescott because everything sort of spun me into that direction after I got up there. I went up there for Prescott uh, Center College at the time, 1976, and uh, then started over to Yavapai College where I was a journalism student. And during that time period, we were required to process our own film, which was in a developer that was called UFG. It was like a three-minute because it was just down and dirty. You just wanted to get the image so you could put it uh, in in the newspaper, essentially. So there really wasn't – it wasn't like archival stuff. Oh, wow. It was pretty quick, down and dirty. I mean, we even had a stabilizer processor uh, for when we do our uh, our silk screen or our, our – our, prints of the uh, images that of course had dot matrix on them wow and all of that was hand hand done i mean you laid up the film or you laid everything down when you were in in the um uh when you were laying out your newspapers it was all done on boards wow with uh um strips of printed you know your text printed on the strips. It was compugraphic at that time, so it was all printed on a, on that, and you would you would cut it out, wax it up, paste it down. So everything you're doing in the different Adobe programs or whatever's available to you today on online, we would do in uh, by hand back then. So mm. wow, yeah, it's a, it's amazing. It's like uh, collaging things together in order to to make a make it work. Yeah, I mean you don't have. Uh, the the programs that we do now and uh you had to have this done in some fashion so yep um it's awesome no my whole start was as a result of that i had to go to the local camera store one day to pick up some film for film and development materials for um for the darkroom at the journalism and that was jane carter's camera center at the time which was located right in downtown prescott and I was in the darkroom section. And at that time, believe it or not, camera stores actually carried all kinds. I mean, you could go in and buy all your developers. You could buy mm-hmm. your papers. You could buy anything you wanted. The film, obviously, everything was there because that was the that was the age. I mean, yeah. you know, it didn't, it, digital wasn't even a concept in our mind at that time. Yeah. And uh, I was standing in there getting some film and getting some developer, actually, back in the darkroom section. And one of the salespeople came up and asked me, he goes, oh, you, you, you do darkroom work? And I was kind of like, well, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I didn't have a lot of experience in it. But yes, I do. And he said, well, you looking for a job? <laughs> oh, man, hey, I'm, I'm, in co- I'm in college, you know, yeah, I'll take a job. So that I was hired to um, and was trained to work in their darkroom just in black and white processing. And then that eventually stepped into where I was uh, also doing the copy work, which led to later in my year and in, in my years and career in uh, photography. So, yeah, that was the very beginning. I had a great yeah. teacher that was one of the uh, front room sales guys that really was my first mentor and teacher in photography because uh, I didn't know a whole lot about any of the steps I was doing in the dark room, but it worked out. It was a small, you know, it was a small market, but yeah. we, uh, the fun thing about that was working in a camera store in a small town like that is, especially if you worked up front after a while, you really got to know everybody mm-hmm. in that town because everybody came through there at some point or another. You know, to get your drop off their film, buy cameras, anything yeah. along those lines. We had camera bags. I mean, you know, it was a, a total, uh, totally different era. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, you're, the younger people listening, like you just walked in, got a job. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and it was hand, it, yeah, it was I was just I didn't even have to put a resume in. Yeah, I didn't have to upload it. was it. a good thing that I didn't, didn't have, have to have put to, a it would have been a pretty bleak resume. <laughs> <laughs> have to upload it online and then rewrite it online. <laughs> didn't have yeah. chat GPT there to help you. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. No, I, uh, I still haven't. Yeah. I've kind of explored that a little bit, not much yet. Um, so so that was uh you said that was the 70s 80s yeah 1977 1977 seven it's 1977 when i started at jane carter's camera center worked there for two years and during that time um not only was i being taught by uh russ smith who was the guy that worked up front uh, i met a another commercial artist there by doing a, a copy job for him and that was Tom Gregory, and he really became my first mentor in just the arts, commercial arts and all that. In fact, he was the one that eventually suggested I uh, look into opening up a little studio of my own and just photographing artwork, 
which has really, my career uh, commercially was based pretty much around reproduction of artwork, although I've done a lot of other things. But that was my central uh, focus for probably the last 30 something years of my career. So after, uh, after Prescott, where did you, uh, where did photography lead you, uh, on your journey into, into film? Well, I, um, <laughs> it was through Tom uh, being a commercial artist. He was semi-retired at that point. He was in his fifties. He was kind of a, uh, came out of that era of the, the madman era in, uh, in, uh, uh, commercial art and okay. art studios. He worked for uh, Ryan Aeronautics for years as a commercial illustrator in San Diego. Oh, but wow. he also had uh, jobs that he was doing in Detroit, Michigan, which is where he grew up, actually. Uh, he would go back every six months and work in uh, ad agencies there as a retoucher for car ads, you know, because that's all the, what the market was. Well, it was one connection and another, and he had a cousin who was an executive at one of the ad agencies. And it was through Tom that I ended up getting in that connection that I ended up getting hired at a dye transfer lab in Detroit. So in 1979, probably April, I think it was, no, it was actually a little earlier. And it was probably February of 1979. I ended up in Detroit, Michigan Mm -hmm. and started working for a dye transfer lab. And that was really pretty cool. Uh, That's what, it was at that moment, I was very young. I was probably three years, four years in photography at that point, two, three years. Um, and that really that really showed me what photography was capable of doing because of the things that we would do in that lab. It really trans it it was a transition period for me as a, as a uh, career photographer. Oh. Awesome. What was Detroit like back then? I'm curious like that. That time period is an interesting time period with Detroit because I feel like it was on that cusp of like things kind of falling apart. <laughs> uh, it was uh, the first place I stayed for the first month, you know, because I, I arrived and I kind of got picked up at the airport, got dropped off at a hotel that evening, which was right downtown. And then the next day I went to work and somebody took me out, kind of drove me around and we found this spot and I went up and actually got a little place to live. Uh, but it had all bars on the windows, and I wasn't sure if that was because they wanted to keep people out or were they trying to keep <laughs> people in, you know? <laughs> but no, there was still the time, because um, I was there during uh, October when it was still traditional that they had all the fires mm-hmm. uh, during the, um, uh, I think it was during Halloween. I forget what they call it, black something or other, but uh, it was still common for uh, several places to be kind of torched during that time period in, in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. it, I was there the year that Ronald Reagan was, uh, they had the the, um, the Republican Party. That was the convention where he was nominated to be the candidate for the presidency, of course, which we know how that ended up, right? Yeah. But mm-hmm. that was in Detroit, Michigan that year at the Renaissance Hotel. Wow. And I can remember one of the things about Detroit that was, I'm not sure how it is now, but back then in the 70s, You'd have this phenomenal brand new building and right next door to it is just literally, I mean, the wall sharing space, right? Mm -hmm. It was just this old dilapidated old building that hadn't been used for years. So it was a real dichotomy of the new and the old. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was a great experience. It was, it was an interesting place to live. Uh, yeah. I'm not real drawn to Michigan. My my second wife was raised in Michigan, and I went back up there one time to visit her mom, with her. And I just it, Michigan's an interesting an interesting state to me. It's not uh, it's a state of mind. Yeah. <laughs> is that on their license plate? I don't know what that is or not. Simply for me, Michigan. it was a state of mind. Yeah. Pure Michigan. Pure yeah. Michigan. Pure Michigan. There's some Michigan. funny videos online Something. if you look up pure Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah, that was an influence, influential time. Um, one of the things that was really cool about the about the lab was we were working with film uh, in there, but there were three sections. I mean, it, most of my background uh, early on has been uh, was in photo commercial photo finishing labs, and uh, Langdon and Wynn in Detroit was one of them, uh, which was the dye transfer. But that was probably. I would say at least a 10,000 square foot 
warehouse. Mm. That, wow. Yeah, I mean, there was there were five camera rooms alone, and each camera room was equipped. We called them camera rooms. They were really enlarging rooms. And each each one of those rooms, which is what I worked in, I worked in that section of the uh, of the process. There were three sections. There was the separation room uh, department. And they did all the separations uh, from the transparency material into the matrix film that we would work with to create the matrixes. So they would separate out with the primary colors of light, red, green, and blue, out wow. to um, create your negatives that would create your cyan, magenta, and yellow uh, matrixes. And so that was all done in that part, and then it would be brought into the um, uh, camera rooms where I was working, and that was all 8x10 Elwood enlargers. So we had two 8x10 Elwood enlargers, and everything throughout the entire operation was pen registered, all the way from where they first started in the in the uh, film room to where it came in through our room, and then it's pen registered even when they do the the rollout of the film. But most of the film that we were processing was uh, anywhere from 16 by 20 to 24 by 30. Oh wow, uh, that's sheets large. of film. Yeah, it was, and it was all done in tray. And it was a pyro developer, pyro gallic uh, based uh, developer that we would develop the material in. And you had three minutes to uh, to pro- process three sheets of this 16 by, let's just take a 16 by 20 sheet of film. There's three of them. And you had to process all that in about two and a half to three minutes in the developer. So you can imagine sticking this in. If you've done four by five sheet film in a tray, oh, yeah. it's the same process. Only now you're working with much larger sheets of film. And you only have a very limited period of time. And the critical nature of it was you had to do that in such a way that there was no streaking on any one of those sheets. Because if you did that, you're back in the dark room recreating more matrix film. Oh, jeez. Because then that, that matrix film, which really when it was finished and taken into the dyeing area where you put it in trays where you know your, your yellow uh, uh, matrix film was put in the yellow tray and subsequently cyan and and magenta. Rarely did we really do black, although you could have a black uh, 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 sheet if you needed to, but they really pretty much, it was done just with cyan, magenta, and yellow to create a full color image at the other end mm. on paper. Interesting. So this was commercial work? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it was, was all done for advertising agencies. Okay. Everything we did was all directed around the uh, car uh, car industry. Okay. So it was really fun because in, in April and May, we're working on ads. And then in September, you're seeing these ads in magazines that you were working on months earlier. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, what was really interesting was the ad agencies. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but the ad agencies would bring in these what they called stats, which were very simple, almost like um, Xerox quality materials that they had sized up from maybe five, four or five different transparencies. Like the people were in one transparency, the car was in another transparency, the background or the foreground was in another one. And they would bring you a stat that had all this laid up and that's what we would have to put together on one matrix film. And that's what was really interesting. Because now you've got this, you're doing um, maybe two or three different negatives per matrix film. So you're building a composite in film alone, and oh, then man. and then you go process that. Yeah. So that's why you wanted to make sure that when you're doing the processing, and I only was trained initially on the 16 by 20. I eventually migrated up to where I was able to start processing 24 by 30. What was the wow. the end use there? So it, when it came out of production where did that go did that go to it went back to the ad agencies and then they just used it everywhere so like if you mm-hmm. look at car ads that are from like the early 80s you probably had a hand in that yeah it's yeah. interesting that one year so, that one yeah. year yeah. yeah because we were only really cool. one of two dye transfer labs in, in detroit the company i worked with was based originally out of uh, new york and that was where the main office was was okay. in new york so there they were doing more fashion related it still was all because it was such an expensive process it really had to only be commercially um, i mean there were individuals don't get me wrong that were doing dye transfer but for the most part the expense of it didn't really uh, yeah. allow most people to work in dye so transfer. How does dye transfer work exactly? So I've heard the name, but I don't know specifically like what that means. Okay. So you take, it's usually done from transparencies. And like I said, you separate the transparency out into three separate negatives. And the negatives are created by when you expose through um, 
uh, green light, you're creating your, your magenta negative. Okay, and then from that, you're putting that in register, which is a pin register where the negatives actually have a little, where you're actually pinning them. I don't know how to describe that. Kind of like when you do a, um, uh, you know, the what were the, the, the units for, for doing paper? Where you, you like know, screen printing. Yeah, well, not screen printing. Yeah, that's very like similar. three-hole punch. Three-hole punch, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Great. okay. <laughs> it's like a three-hole punch, basically. Yeah. Imagine yeah. that. And then on the other side, you have pens, just like you would when you put it into a notebook. Okay. Yeah. That would that's so that every negative lined, lined up, up. Yeah. perfectly. Okay. Okay. And then that was put in negative carriers in these eight by ten Elwood enlargers, and they were pen registered. So when you locked the the um, when you locked in, it 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 would stay in one spot in the negative and through the enlarger on down. And then the, the, the easel that we were using were all vacuum-based easels with pen registrations there. And so even the matrix film was cut like with a pen hole, like with a, a, a punch, right? Yeah. And then you would put those in register to that degree. Okay. Makes so, sense. So the car companies are sending you the elements of the ad that they Correct. want put together, and then you're combining all of those. Yeah. And that's really done in the, the, the yeah. f- central step is done in the negative room where they're doing all the separations. Yeah. They yeah. create all the Ruby lists and all this other stuff. Because, I mean, look, in Photoshop today, which I only consider Photoshop is just a digital dark room. Mm-hmm. That's all it yeah. really yeah. is. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, we're doing masking in there. Well, back in the days with film, you did you did your masking with things like Ruby Lith, where you actually hand cut the mask, mm-hmm. and uh, or you could use a, another material that was really common, was uh, called pan masking film, and it really mm-hmm. was just to do highlight masking. So it allows you to open up your uh, your shadows, keep your shadows where they weren't getting suppressed. Uh, long enough so you could print down your uh, your highlights and get some detail on the highlights. So, cool. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. The um the so you were essentially creating these masters, correct? Right. And then the masters would get sent out to the to the um, car companies or their advertising. No, they agency. would they would go to the agencies, right? The, the and, agencies. And, and you know it was the main yeah. it was the main car company. I mean it was Ford, GM, uh, Chrysler, all of them, and they were would work with the agencies that would then bring us the ad material. So how does the agency handle the transparency at that point? Is it utilized as like um, lights projected through that, then it's no. printed? Or? It's, no, it's printed. The die transfer, the final output is from the matrix film. Okay. And the matrix right. film is very similar to, if you've looked at the back of a, a piece of Kodachrome where it has a okay. relief image. Yeah. Okay. The same thing with the matrix material. And depending on the thickness of that layer in that matrix, when it goes and is dyed up, that's how much it's almost like a sponge. It soaks the dye into it. So if it's a very oh. thin area of cyan, say, let's take a color red, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're going to build that with magenta. Yeah. And yellow. And it's devoid of cyan. So... In those three matrix films, if that area had red, your yellow and your magenta area are going to be th- are going to be denser areas, and gotcha. there's going to be no density in the cyan in that section of the, of the final image. So you dye these up, and then they're rolled out on paper again with a pen registration system. So you take the matrix film and you roll it out. One wow. at a time, I think the path we did was cyan, magenta, and then we laid yellow down as the last color. And all of these have to lay out in, mm. uh, re- in pure register. Otherwise, you on end top up of one another. seeing each one of those channels right. yeah, um, you'd have of like ink. Yeah, a little cast of like yellow on a corner. So <laughs> yeah. I remember looking at um, cereal boxes when I was a kid, and I'd take the ends open, and you'd see the registration marks that they had uh, for each of the colors. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, yeah. so similar to that, that you right. have that's, uh, that's each the one four of color output. And then that, yeah. that's eventually the reason they did it this way is most of the ads were done composite. In other words, like I said earlier, there were maybe one, two, three elements, three different transparencies and one final image. And we would do the composite so that when we rolled the, the uh, paper out, so we rolled the, film out on the paper rather uh, you had the full image now there was invariably there was always going to be some gaps in where those areas fell in and that's where people like tom 
who was a retoucher working in the ad agencies, it would go back to them and uh, they would fill in those gaps. So by the time it was done, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't know that it was, you would think that, oh, they photographed those people standing next to the car with the mountains in the background. You know, wow. in one shot, but it wasn't. Yeah, they they were done so well that mm-hmm. you would know, mm-hmm. you know. And then, yeah, you think back, you're like, you're looking through, and you're like, how did they do that back then? They didn't really have computers yeah. that were capable of that. No, it was all like, done by no, hand. Yep, it, it was yeah. all done by hand. All there done by hand and film. That. All done by hand and film. Mm-hmm. That's just amazing. It really is. It's yeah. like I manual like Photoshop. It's just, it's almost like an art now when yeah. you look at it because yeah. of all of that, all of what's involved in order to accomplish what it is that you get as a result, but it's, it's a, for the most part, a pretty, pretty analog process. There's no digital to it. So there was no digital whatsoever. Yeah. It feels like it's kind of a shame that that's not, is it still around? Are there people still doing it for a purpose? Is it completely phased out? When did that kind of go away? Uh, around the advent of Photoshop. Photoshop is what killed it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. That's probably a lot of people too that. It was a big industry. It was a big industry because everything, yeah. if, think of what you do now in advertising that Photoshop, Illustrator, all the different programs that we work with today yeah. are now doing. All of that was done by hand originally. And yeah. so you had your retouchers, your commercial artists. I mean, there were, there were commercial artists working in the agencies that they could spray paint a car uh, on, a, you know, on a piece of paper. And by the time they were done, you would swear it was a photograph of that car. That's how that's how talented some of these people were with airbrush and and mm-hmm. the dyes. That's just amazing. Now the reason that we used it in the dye transfer was they could also uh, they could also take the dye back out of the print if they need to. So it was dye, and then they're working with dyes to fill it in, just like we would if we're spotting a print. Right. You know, that's really just a dye that you're spotting those little areas with in a print. Which I hated. I never liked spotting. <laughs> spotting sounds like a, a, a struggle, <laughs> an art in itself. <laughs> it, it is. It truly is. Um, especially if you're doing like a large gray area that's got a little dot, like a like a sky. You know, it's almost. Oh, yeah. It's just got that one. You know, kind of a. I would refer to it like a zone seven tone. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it's very very difficult to match that. Yep. I have to look around. I had a ad week. Cause so ad week was like the you know advertising back in the day mm-hmm. book. they had a very large like compendium that they used to do at the end of the year of like all the different artists and stuff and i'm now just having flashbacks to that um but they would have the the compendium book of both um photography and the art end so they'd have two books right and then it'd have all the references to all those artists that did that stuff and i remember that being like yeah, those captivating the, as a kid those were the source books yeah. that were that were created um there were three companies main companies in the country uh, there was black book uh on the east coast which was out in new york and then there was mother's i can't remember what the other one was something mother uh mother book or something like that out of uh, california and those were the two big ones mm-hmm. uh which is an interesting story because that kind of goes back into a, we'll touch on that a little bit later but n- my period in 1990s where I started getting into the digital work that kind of touches into that. So, but, um, yeah, those were all the, all those, all those books were created and then passed out to all the agencies in the country. And that's how commercial illustrators and photographers, that was their way of getting work they coming back in. And those door. books were thick. Oh, they, they were, were heavy were, and thick. And <laughs> there was a lot of, lot of <laughs> artists in there. I'm just thinking, oh man, all their jobs, all those people's like got replaced. <laughs> um, but not the, well, not so much the so artists and the artists, illustrator yeah, yeah, and the yeah. photographers because they just transitioned, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's, that's kind of what, in a different way. Yeah. I, you know, I kind of look at myself. I, I think I mentioned this to you in the other day of just being one of those, uh, I've kind of been one of the, in that membership of, of, creatives that is a crossover between yeah. analog and then into digital because at the time I got started there was nothing but analog and then we had to adapt if we were going to continue forward with the digital processes that came about in the early 90s um, I was introduced to Photoshop actually from a good friend of mine when I, I lived in Eugene Oregon from 19 uh, from the late part of the 1980, all the way into 1985. And during that time, I had the privilege of meeting a number of people. I did a lot of photography work. I worked at a a large 
photo finishing lab uh, as their chemical technician for about four years in Eugene. But I, during that time, I also started my own studio and such. Um, uh, that was Dot Dotson's. That was a great place to work. That was a really fascinating experience. And I think for those people who work at home or have their own small dark rooms, and aren't familiar with, because commercial photo finishing outside of what you have maybe a Tempe camera here locally or a few labs, it's not as prevalent as it was back in that time period where yeah. you had these massive labs that were running um, E6 and C41, black and white, you know, the R processes for uh, taking transparency material and then printing that and then also the uh, negative material and printing on, on the paper. Uh, all of that was done like on 500 foot rolls of paper. And in these labs, you're not mixing just a, a, a quart of developer. Like my job in the, in the chemistry department was maintaining all the replenishers. And most of those vats were all 150 gallon vats of chemistry Jesus. that we were, that I was mixing. <laughs> so, you know, it was a whole different whole different concept of and everything you you were not going to refill the um because it was all de developed around uh, the concept of replenishment so you had these tanks that had the main chemistries that the that the paper and everything were running through the film we had dip and dunks where you were dipping um 35 millimeter all the way up to four by five or sheet film if you need any type of sheet film and through yeah. these processes and those were large pieces of uh, mechanical equipment with probably 50 gallons of, of chemistry in every one of its tanks. So y you were doing steps, uh, densitometry and such, testing all the time to keep that developer at a certain constant. And that's what the replenishment was all about, you know, because obviously as you run stuff through, it's going to degrade the, the chemistry just like we do in our own dark rooms. Mm -hmm. But you, would, you couldn't dump that chemistry. You had to keep that uh, at a certain consistency consistency so yeah, yeah. Oh, fun yeah. stuff learned a lot learned a learned a heck of a lot oh um, yeah absolutely during that time period what were you doing through your own so you set up your own studio at that point what kind of work were you doing that's when i started doing uh, specializing in reproduction of artwork and i had my own uh, black and white dark room i still was doing uh, the color work was being outsourced uh, mm. I was doing a lot of transparency. I got my first 4x5 camera uh, in 1978. It was a Toyo View. had a Schneider 210 on it. Mm -hmm. It was a nice. It was, it was, I knew early on that I was wanting to work with large format. And pretty much the early part of my career, the first 30 years, was all 4x5. I did some stuff in 35, 2 and a quarter, 120 rather, and, and uh, that. But I would say the bulk of my work was uh, 4x5. Yeah. So how did you fall into reproduction work? I'm assuming there was some artists that needed some sort of. You know, I think it was a, sh it was an offshoot of just starting out from my early years with Jane Carter's where I was doing uh, copy work. I mean, people would bring in, you know, old photographs mm -hmm. or they'd bring in artwork and we had a, we had a vertical setup uh, where we could copy that. Uh, it was all Polaroid based. And we also, one of the other things that was really cool during that time period was um, taking we had a, a four lens, which I'm looking for one. I actually found one the other day, and I think it'd be great to convert to film again. It was a four lens uh, Polaroid camera that would give you on one sheet of four by five Polaroid, you had four passport pictures that were perfectly sized. And so you just, you'd shoot one picture <laughs> of the person <laughs> and you'd get four prints on one piece and then you would just cut it. They'd take it in and that was their passport. They could take that to the, oh, to yeah. the oh, nice. state department for their passport pictures. I found one on eBay the other day for, I think it was like $52. Oh, wow. That, machine, that camera. And I'm thinking about picking that up. Do you know what oh. film that shoots? Is that six 600 or is that? Uh, um... Oh gosh, I don't recall i it seems like 600 would be it might have been it was it was similar well type 55 of course was the negative uh, positive uh, right variation right. but it was it was i i do not recall i wish yeah I could. yeah the um i know they discontinued spectra um was it a year and a half ago two years ago now um that uh you just can't get spectra anymore they were having issues with it even with the changeover um, impossible took over the, the Polaroid, 
um, manufacturing of the film and created their own and then Polaroid bought it back and then uh, they just couldn't get the spectra to be the right thickness. So um, they discontinued the, that film, unfortunately. And that was a, that's a larger format uh, mm -hmm. Polaroid. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, that sounds like a really awesome camera to, to shoot with. It's kind of like I think a, it's such be, a perfect use too. Well, yeah. and it, the back, because the back was a, uh, it came off just like, so I think I'm thinking that it could actually be adapted to one of my Graflex backs that I have. Oh, absolutely. And for sheet film. Fine. Yeah, awesome. because it was a four by five size format. I mean, in, in the end, you know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you had two, you know, whatever the passport pictures are, they were two by two and you had four of those on one sheet. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's perfect. You still have to send in, you can't do a digital, I don't think, on passport photos. I think you still have to do an actual photo yeah. photo. <laughs> like uh, yeah, the, my last passport that I got this last year up, updated, I did them at, I just went to Walgreens and they did it digitally. They take a picture and they mm -hmm. print it out off of their... Um, the little um, printer. Yeah. 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 It wasn't an inkjet printer. I think it was a different... It may have been dye sublimation. When I worked at Office Max, we were doing passport photos and um, we would basically have them stand there in front of a little, you know, square to get their face. Mm -hmm. No smiling, no expression. You're just supposed to be plain face, straight look into the camera and then uh, we take your picture and then uh, we had this little thing that would crop it. So w you would take the picture and the back of the screen of the camera had a little thing that showed where your head would, uh, would be. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would just plug the camera directly into this little dye sublimation printer. And we had a little press as well where you would um, uh, basically cut the pictures out. So it was uh, as streamlined as they could get it to be consistent. Um, but... I don't understand how they made a profit with that whole system. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you offer it as a, as a service, but I guess, I don't know, uh, get more people in, but, um, yeah, uh, we were doing that as well, but I think my passport photo has me doing, it's a selfie off my phone. <laughs> just, just enough. It looks so bad. <laughs> Need to update it's, that. It's a Doesn't, passport. It's a passport. They're supposed to look just awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mine looks really not like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it. Well, it's like your driver's license picture. Yeah, 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 it's a yeah. Similar, similar thing. I had one when I was my first driver's license photo was really nice. I still have the license. I'm like, man, why can't I recreate that? <laughs> it looked really bad since. Yeah. Yeah. So the. You know, the whole, overall, I mean, how about the how about the elephant in the room, right? Which is yeah. digital. Digital. Yeah. Digital. What did you, know? you think when digital came out? What were your first impressions of digital when you first hold, held a digital camera, took a photo with it, saw the results? Like, where were you with that? Well, that was probably actually the camera part. Actually, using a digital camera was more in the latter part of the 1990s. My early experience was, uh, as I started to say, I kind of we've kind of spun off of that. But in the late 80s, a friend of mine came. Uh, I was living back in Prescott at this point. I had moved from Prescott in '85, uh, or from Eugene back to Prescott in '85, and he came to visit. He was a photography student at University of Oregon which when I was there and in some of the people that I got to meet in my life have been really pretty cool. Uh, Ted Orland, who was Ansel Adams first, uh, printer that Ansel had uh, hired in the early seventies was now an instructor in the mid eighties at the university of Oregon, uh, teaching the photography classes. Uh, you know, Ansel passed away in, I think it was 1984 and Ted stopped working with him somewhere in 77, maybe about the time I got into photography and, yeah. uh, he ventured somehow or another, he ended up in U university of Oregon. So that was fun because I could go, I was not a student, but I had friends that were in the classes and I could go and sit in on the lectures and stuff oh, wow. uh, during that. So that was a real, that was a real treat. He's a character, uh, Ted Orland. He's, he's got, uh, if you ever look him up sometime, he's, he's, okay. his images are quite comical. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was, he was, uh, a, obviously really good friends with Ansel. I think one of the things that people get uh, don't understand about Ansel Adams is, yeah, he brought forth the concept of the zone system. And we talk about film. Okay, that's a critical part. Yep. But what the zone system really was all about, as far as Ansel, uh, was about pre-visualization. 
you know, like how can I, and, and that's really what we learn as photographers, isn't it? Is, is the photographic eye, you know, yeah. we develop our eye and what, what is that? What does that mean? You know, we get, we have to begin somewhere the process of learning to see the world the way a camera sees the world and not the way we normally would see it. Otherwise people who don't use a camera wouldn't understand that concept. Right. Um, and that's just, we hone that skill years and years and years and years of, of working with the camera. Previsualization is a big part of what Ansel was all really trying to teach people was, and that was the zone system was simply a way of calibrating the basis of photography, which was densitometry. And when I was talking about the photo finishing labs and we were about keeping the chemistries uh, cued to the right, you know, saturation of chemistry. So it was always processing pretty consistently the paper and the film. Yep. That was all done on densitometry. We would run these tests and then we'd take them over to a densitometer and it would give us the readings that would tell us, oh, we need to add some more replenisher. You know, we're a little under replenished, so we might shoot a little more into that tank. And the chemistry rooms that I was working in uh, were, oddly enough, on the second floor of the processing facilities. And you had these 100, and, 100 to 150 gallon vats, depending on what process we were working with. And like take C41, for instance, that was what, six, six different chemistries mm -hmm. that were involved just in C41. So you've got, you've got tanks that are 100 gallon, 150 gallon tanks six times over. So imagine what the chemistry room looks like when you're running, when you're running E6, you're running C41, you're running black and white, oh, um, and then also the paper chem the paper processes to on the supplement side of that. That's why I'm saying commercial photo finishing uh, back then was a completely different animal. Uh, I mean, even the the mixers were 36 inches in diameter and about five feet high. They had in the center a three and a half to five horsepower motor that was mounted directly center over the center and then very much like um you know when you mix paint with yeah. one of the you know in a, yeah. in a, in a uh, drill with just one of these yeah. little propeller systems well imagine that same system that you're doing with the paint only now the propeller is about three and a half feet long and it goes straight down in the chemistry and it's spinning and mixes all your chemistry wow. and the, the, the chemistry that we were getting uh, to mix in there it was filled with water obviously uh, filtered water and then um we didn't of course use distilled at that level <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we were using heavy <laughs> filtration yeah um the boxes that we would get would be five gallon boxes of, uh, of just the concentrate and it was mixed kind of like you know when you get these um when you get these bulk wine boxes you mm -hmm. know that have the the plastic container inside it yeah that was the very same thing it was just that we had these square boxes that were five gallons of concentrate and you would have to lift these up and pour them into the end of the mixer oh, as wow. and then it would pump over but the reason that that the the reason that these uh lab or these uh, chemistry rooms were at least in the labs i worked in was everything was gravity fed okay so it was all fed through PVC pipe down to the processors on the, on the floor below. So you didn't have to run pumps at that point. It was all just, it would just all flow with gravity. Wow. And then you could control the amount of uh, replenishment that was going in, in, in any given tank, depending on the amount of film you were processing. Some nights we might have only did, you know, a hundred sheets of four by five in a tank. Sometimes you might've had three or 400 sheets of film to run that night because we were we were a processing lab in in eugene they had uh, dot dotson's actually had four stores in in the state of oregon one up in portland one in bend one down in salem and then of course the main office that was in eugene plus we were handling processing that was coming in from all other uh, uh you know sub uh, outlets basically photographers uh, other photo stores different things like that so we were processing a lot of film in the course of a day Oh, man. Sounds was like you're dangerous? busy. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Was that dangerous to an extent? Like the oh, absolutely. Then, they were absolutely yeah. caustic in a lot of ways. They were caustic in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, there's uh, there's nothing like the smell of hypo in the morning. Now, <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, but take 150 <laughs> gallons of hypo. Oh, you know, that's, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, but in these tanks, okay, one of the things that was in these tanks, we had floating lids. All right. So they were a plastic lid. 
that would actually that would just sit on top of the chemistry, mm -hmm. which would keep the air, you know, from getting to the chemistry yeah. basically. And so the floating lids, as the, as the chemistry is being used, it would drop down, and then there was a point where I knew I would have to make up another uh, batch of chemistry for that particular tank. That right. was my job, and most of the time, uh, my job was a night job. So I came in, mm -hmm. you know. Seven eight o'clock at night and work till three in the morning, and uh, which is still kind of the course of my life even to the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sticks with you. <laughs> it does. It does. I'm just I'm a night owl. You know what yeah. can I say? It's, uh, it's a different lifestyle when you yeah. work at night. And people don't get it. You know, so somebody will call me and I go, oh, yeah, I just got up. It's nine thirty in the morning. They go, yeah, you're sleeping in. I'm like, well, no, I you know. Went to bed at three thirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. So it's it's kind of fun. It, it, that was um, that taught me a lot, and it was years later in the uh, in the eighties uh, when I came back to Prescott in eighty five eighty six that I opened up my own uh, dark room and facility there where I was hand processing C forty one E six. And also Cibachrome out of my, as well as black and white in my little studio space. And I had the studio space was set up all around photographing artwork. So I had a table and a, a, a rail system for my 4x5 camera that I could run back and forth on this rail system uh, depending on where I needed to be. And I was in a, I was working out of a single car garage that was fairly long, but it wasn't real wide, you know. Yeah. Um, that was a great experience. It was during that time. I met a couple of people that uh, were influential too back in, and as far back as the 70s in Prescott. One, uh, I can remember the first time that I met uh, Frederick Summers, uh, Summer, and um, and then also Jay Dussard. Both of those were photographers that were working out of Prescott at the time. Of course, Fred worked uh, in Prescott, had lived there since the 1930s. Okay. And, uh, and then Jay was uh, uh, an instructor at the time. He was an instructor at the original Prescott College, which was the campus that now is Embry-Riddle up there. That originally was Prescott College's campus. Not when I went there. When I went there, that campus had already closed. They revised, and uh, we were working. Uh, our whole school was 80 students out of the basement of the Hacienda Hotel, which is, at that <laughs> time, it was a retirement. It was not a hotel anymore. It was a retirement uh, facility. And, and now it is, a, a, a again, a hotel. It was revised back in the late 80s at that time. But, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Fun yeah, times in Prescott. Sounds sounds like Prescott was a, a awesome place to be for you. Yeah. What was the place to be? It, <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed to be a lot of things opened up for me in Prescott. Um, I will tell you, there's a number of the photography is a has a real strong root in in Prescott with not only those two individuals, but a number of other photographers. It just seems to be kind of a haven that's that was drawn for photographers there. Yeah. yeah. So who's, who is uh, Frederick Summers? Summer. Summer. Fred Summer. Uh, Frederick Summer is, he's, he's probably recognized he, by far. I will tell you this. He is recognized as one of the best printers ever in, in the field of photography. He was not as well known, but he right. was known in the community of photographers. Uh, and he was right up there with, uh, with uh, he was good friends with like uh, uh, Edward Weston. Weston came to visit Fred, Frederick Sommer a couple of times. And uh, who is Fred? Jeez. <laughs> you have to, you have to look yeah. at his work. You have to look at his work. It's hard to describe what a, but his, his role in photography was instrumental. Okay. Absolutely. And he was here in Prescott. Uh, he was here in uh, Arizona. There's another wonderful photographer that's uh, made his mark in platinum that lives in Flagstaff is another, uh, uh, and that's Dick Arntz. And Dick is probably, I would say, now in his early 90s. Uh -huh. But uh, he wrote the book on platinum back in the 80s, and that, that book is still well sought after. And he does do follow-ups on that uh, on that book, but he's kind of the master of uh, the platinum printing process, uh, so to speak, as a, as an instructor. Back oh then. yeah, yeah, that process is uh, pretty phenomenal. Platinum yeah. palladium is is something something else. Um, 
after seeing some of uh, um, Flagstaff camera and uh, hidden hidden light, I guess is the moniker that they're under for that. Um, oh, they do some phenomenal stuff. Oh, some yeah. big things. Oh it's yeah, amazing what they do. You saw yeah. their trays. I'm like, oh my god. That's so expensive. Yeah, <laughs> and the process. I mean, they they utilize uh, digital composites of multiple images to to get a, a large uh, digital contact sheet that then they use the the platinum palladium run that across the, the sheet of paper and then um, do the processing from there. And I mean, they've got it down to a science. And and I got to see some of the some of the work up there. Um, a couple years back and just just blown away at, at the uh, tonality that platinum and palladium really have mm -hmm. so um, definitely a treat to to see that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. one of these days i'll i'll have to experiment with that i know you do platinum palladium mm -hmm. yeah yeah bit. i was first shown my buddy that i told you about that came from um university of oregon uh bill uh back at that time he was a real big platinum and palladium printer and so i kind of learned we became good friends in the um uh, in the 80s in the early 80s when i was living in eugene uh, and i learned from him some of the process of platinum and palladium and then just kind of you know it's like anything else you you, you just have to do it you, yeah you can only take it so far with somebody showing you the steps and if you don't take it further uh you lose it you know you forget right. it uh or you don't really gain all the benefits of having done it and experiment with yourself. I, I know, Stacy, you do cyanotype, you know, and mm -hmm. I've never really ventured into cyanotype too much, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Anytime we do any alternative process, uh, and, and oddly enough, I would have never thought in my day that I would be sitting here in 2023 talking about <laughs> silver gelatin being a historical process <laughs> but it is uh so to speak you know i mean that you were asking earlier about the digital when when bill came to visit me in prescott he brought with him a floppy disk because they were um using uh the university systems some of the schools for beta testing, and at the time it was all on floppy disk, and this was the preeminent, the premier uh, beta version of what then became Adobe Photoshop. Mm. So my first experience with that was probably 1989. I had a small Macintosh SE that I had bought in '88, and so I was beginning to step into digital a little bit, but you know I still was shooting film and did do film all the way up until 2000. Uh, 2009 uh, in my in my operations i'm doing it again now but there was a period where i didn't uh and mostly just transparency so he brought this and then of course photoshop came out commercially available in the latter part of 1992 and i bought my first copy of that which was version 2.5 mm. and then within about six months they came out with 3.0 uh, and that that really was the big transition for Photoshop. And then it just seeded itself in the industry there going forward from then. So I've been working in Photoshop since, uh, you know, 1993, essentially. Oh, wow. So you've been there since the beginning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, literally, literally. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, and I love it as a tool. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, uh, I do, I work every day in Photoshop and have for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, and when we were talking about the source books in 1995, uh, just before that, I worked for a group here called Phoenix Art Press. And at the time they were Phoenix Art Press, then they became Phoenix Art Group. Uh, they were a, a fine art um, fabrication company, basically. They did, uh, they were a major player in the interior design market internationally, actually. And uh, we had over 100 artists on staff that were doing uh, recreations of the same piece over and over and over again. So it was rep repetition. But what they were really well known for was they introduced a lot of frame designs that they did all with just raw raw uh, framing material, and then they would paint on it and such. I was hired by them to do a gig um, in 1993 because every six months they were doing shows at High Point, North Carolina, and that was their main shows. So when they would do that, they would build up a new product line of almost 300 images of, of framed work that was their 
that was their line that all their salespeople would go out across the country and even internationally uh, and market their artwork, right? Wow. Uh, yeah, it was, it, they were a major, major <laughs> player. I mean, this, these people were very deep-pocketed and um, uh, very influential. Uh, it was John Klein and uh, Joe Grazia uh, that owned the company, and uh, it was mostly built around a fellow by the name of John Klein who uh, was a phenomenal artist of his own right. And uh, anyway, so I was hired to photograph the artwork for them because that was already my specialty. I'd been doing this for 10 years. And uh, once I started working with them, it was only going to be for the gig for the two months. And then it eventually ended up where they hired me full time to create a photo finishing lab in-house for them. And uh, that's what I did up until 95 is I worked for them. And then in 95, I started my own company, Parhelion Press, which was uh, incorporated. And my whole goal with Parhelion Press in the beginning was to bring the source books digitally online. And uh, we tried introducing that concept. I had one person working with me, uh, a Kelly, who had worked with one of the source book companies, uh, a, a more local one, Southwest Sourcebook. And she was uh, one of my employees and helping kind of because of her background with the print version. And the whole concept was this, okay? When you did the printed version, they would come and sell you the ad. And it was anywhere from three to $5,000 by the time a photographer and illustrator was done because you had to do your own separation negatives. You had to get your own seps. You had to, get, you had to build your ad. You bought the ad space in the book. And then these books, like uh, you were mentioning, were eight and a half by 11 or larger, but they were at least, you know, three to four inches thick. So you can imagine how many pages of artwork is in these books. Well, it took almost 18 months from the time they first showed up in your door and you bought into it to the time that they were finally being distributed mm -hmm. freely to all of the ad agencies in the country. Okay. And that was the whole gig. My concept was... Well, by the time somebody sees my artwork or my photograph, it's 18 months old. Yeah. <laughs> and we're coming Jeez. into it and we're coming into this age of I had been around some people uh, with the internet, you know. Yeah. I had my first I had my first email address I think in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> so, the concept was to try to develop a um, no pun intended, a uh, um, an online version of these source books. It was one of the hardest concepts to sell to people in 19... You would have thought, you know, here you're dealing with creative people, you know, the creative talent, right? Yeah. It's a very hard for people to get their arms around the concept of going online in 1995. Yeah. That did not last very long. I, it took me... It probably, I tried this for about a year, and then I had to move on to something else. And in 96, late 96, I was introduced to... Um, uh, to digital printing with the Iris Cytex equipment. And I had a 3047 Iris Cytex and opened um, Perhelium Press, went from the digital there into the digital of output of artwork. So I had, uh, had opened up a company that was really the very first uh, digital art reproduction uh, printing facility in the state of Arizona. There was only about 15 of us in the country that were even doing that uh, on that level wow. at that time. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I was, again, on the, on the cusp of, you know, what we now call, which I personally, I have a hard time. I, you know, I had to bite my tongue when I use the word jaclé because I never liked that term. <laughs> <laughs> call them what they are. They're digital art reproductions is really it. Right. Um, it, it just that kind of, to me, that kind of made a little bit of a cheesy aspect to it you know it's kind of a cutesy little thing to me right personally i mean i when i would sell things they were an iris graphic because i was working with iris cytex 3047 which was a phenomenal printer when it was modified for printing artwork you had to do some modifications to handle the the, the weight of the paper and those were done by two companies uh one on the east coast who i bought my equipment through was um john cone and uh then there was uh, graham nash of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, who had his facility up in uh, San Francisco, and he was creating and modified these Iris Cytexes as early as the early 90s. Both John Cohn. John Cohn was a printmaker uh, and uh, a 
course, uh, Graham Nash was a photographer after he uh, retired doing music. Oh, I well, didn't know that. Yeah. I have to, what, what kind of work did he do? I was unaware. Um, he did mostly, you know, I wouldn't say commercial work. He did a lot of fine art type things, mm-hmm. you know, just, just a lot of what we do as, uh, as general photographers. I mean, he did portraits and a variety of different just things, different landscapes. Things. Yeah, different things yeah. along those lines. Yeah, you should look it up. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was he had probably just equally as successful a career as a uh, as a photographer. Uh, but I think his Im- his impact in the marketplace was more with the uh, Graham Nash editions, which is what he built. Where you can you, and there's I believe they're still in operation even to this day. Yeah, which was kind of the same thing that we were doing with the um, they were the model uh, Graham Nash. And John Cohn both were doing uh, addition printing with these Iris Cytex equipment because at that time you didn't have uh, Epson hadn't converted their plotter printers into what we now know and you know all the other companies uh, Epson was probably the preeminent one in the beginning uh, yeah. of all kind of different ones now HP and on and on but uh, yeah that was the transition period however. During all that time, like I had, for instance, I had a large uh, drum scanner uh, in the in as part of the equipment, and that scanner alone was almost a, I think we leased it for over thirty thousand oh, dollars. I mean, you know, it was oh. a really high end uh, ScanView drum scanner, and we could do up to eight by ten transparencies on it. Uh, rarely did I you could do thirty five and smaller film, but mostly it was uh, done for four by five and and that as far as in my operation. Because everything I was still doing was four by five transparencies when I was photographing the artwork, I was recording that on the, on the right. uh, on four by five transparency. Yeah. And when I worked with the Phoenix Art Group, we were doing all of that processing in house. Wow. I think your was it your LinkedIn? It has a stat in there about how many artwork, how much artwork you've actually re- reproduced. Yeah, I think it's close to. I would have to say probably around. I can guess around thirty-five to forty thousand pieces in my career. <laughs> it's hard to wrap my head around that. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, and not not. It's that was probably more up through two thousand nine. You know, that was from nineteen eighty-five all the way to two thousand nine. Uh, I kind of closed the studio, uh, which I had converted from Parhelion Press. We kind of closed that, reshaped to Itera Art in two thousand one, and at that point. Other than the film, everything else was all digital. And you asked about my first digital camera. The mm-hmm. first digital camera I had was a little Epson, <laughs> you know, uh, basically point and shoot. It really mm-hmm. wasn't, uh, and, and I think it was maybe at best a three megapixel. Yeah, they were pretty yeah. low there at the yeah. beginning. Oh, they were really low at yeah. the beginning. I mean, it was almost a joke. Especially when you're working with a four by five, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, 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 and you're producing, Very yeah. Different. I mean, like when I uh, absolutely because when I would scan on four by five, I was producing a hundred and fifty to three hundred meg file that we were working with for the uh, for the output on the on the uh, iris equipment, and then eventually I moved phased out of the iris and adapted into the Epson printers in probably 1990 or not 1990 around 2001 2002 I started using more Epson is is Iris still in business are they still there actually is a company that is doing a that is still selling the Iris uh, Cytex but they're the earlier and they've modified them again to the current no oh, okay but and they're uh, it's out of New Hampshire, and I can't think of the name. It was the same company. What was the name of that company? It was where we bought all our we bought all of our um, uh, servicing for mechanics, mechanical servicing from this company. Oh, okay, uh, it'll come to me I, anyway. Yeah. But, and, and they've they still have stayed in the business uh, and doing now. Uh, they do sell Iris Cytex equipment if you want to still work in the thirty forty seven. It's yeah. a limiting. It's a limited process because it's a. It's a. It's on a drum. Okay, so the paper mounts on a drum, but the large one, the thirty forty seven, was just that. It was a thirty. You could put a thirty five by forty seven inch sheet of paper on it and spin a spin a print off of it. I will tell you, the quality of those, even to this day, supersedes. What you can get on any one of the 
uh, dot or any one of the inkjet printers in this day. And that was also a dye process as well. Wow. It was a pigmented dye. And that was one of the modifications because the original Psychex equipment that was being used, those 3047s, they were originally designed as proofers. Okay. In the uh, for the for the uh, to get uh, four that. color for four color printing, so they were not designed. Uh, they were designed. Hey, here's what your color is going to look like. Great color would fade maybe a month later. You know, right? Because it was only done for proofing. It was just mm-hmm. done before you put the print on the four color pressing or mm-hmm. six color or whatever right. process. So. So that uses a dye process. The, does how does um, how is the image created? Is it using light or is there no? It's, it's, it's very similar process? to the um, no. It's it, it it had a print head just like your um just like uh, your Epson or your digital printers do today. You know your inkjet printers. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did was the print was the resolution better, or is it? It was the matrix that was created, and plus the inks that were coming out were electronically charged. That were coming oh. out of the uh, nozzles. Oh wow! So okay. it was very sophisticated. And what was really kind of interesting is that equipment was designed in the early eighties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Wow. It was, and and here we are. And that's when Graham Nash and them started modifying them in the early nineties for output, uh, adapting them so you could use heavier based watercolor papers. Because of course, for the for the industry, for the commercial printing industry, you didn't need that. You just had a you just had some kind of a uh, you weren't concerned about archival quality or any right. of that type of stuff. So that's what the Cytex were really kind of modified when you bought them from these two companies. The equipment I purchased uh, from Cone back in the East Coast was uh, the total package, the computer, the printer, everything. The software, all of it was $110,000. Wow. So you didn't get into it unless you were serious. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Let's and try then, this this weekend. Then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then and then the scanners and the high end. You know, I had a I had a, a staff of nine people working at one point. Wow, it kind of took a went south right after nine eleven. Well, that's a bummer. Well, yeah, well, it was just the way the nature of the market was. You know, I mean, yeah. none of us could predict a nine eleven. Yeah, that's true. Uh, some companies uh, were able to transition through that. I went from. From nine employees prior to 9-11 to uh, down to myself by 2003. <laughs> oh, wow. Was, was that just people's hesitation to do work in general because well, they didn't quite know where things were going? Yeah. I was, there was two things. I was working at that time because I was on the cusp in the early 90s or in the late 90s. I had accounts from all across the country. I was doing printing for artists on the East Coast yeah. that were sending their files to me. Well, by the early 2000s, that window was closing. There were more and more operations opening up. You know, uh, the market wasn't as broad as it was. So there was a real narrow window of opportunity there that yeah. I just happened to be in the right time and the right place to do. You know? I get you. Right. Um, and some companies had survived. I, I, for some reason, that was just something I didn't have the capacity to do that for some reason. It was my own, you know, we were, um, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I take risks. Some things work out, some things don't. Yeah. Yep. And yep. for me, that one didn't work out. Yeah. Got to try it and see if it works. If it but I did, I did different. continue still photographing uh, artwork. I just had a more limited market. It had to just be my own client. It became more of a boutique kind mm-hmm. of an operation. But I still had all the equipment um, as far as, you know, 44-inch wide Epson printers and uh, could could handle the output. But around 2009, I mean, it, we just really got hit in the marketplace. I mean, look at what happened, 9-11. I was dealing with publishing people and helping people print. And most of that was for the interior design market. Well, after 9-11, everybody kind of closed their pocketbooks up because that yeah. was that was a luxury item. That was not a necessity item. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so once that kind of started to come back and fill the void in 2004, then what happens? We get the housing crisis <laughs> yep. in 2006. Yep. You know, and again, the industry that I was working in, that again... <laughs> Home furnishings, well, people aren't, you know, doing it. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. weren't home furnishing. They were trying to short sell, eventually short selling their houses or being foreclosed on. Yeah. And that was massive in this country. You know, Arizona was one of the five major states that had the most foreclosures in the country. 
Wow. And oddly enough, in 2009, I closed my studio, uh, just started doing my own work, and I went into real estate at that time. <laughs> <laughs> good timing, good timing. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah, you know, sometimes. The real estate uh, boom. The, well, the, the, yeah. I built a house in 2004, which uh-huh. was a super good idea. <laughs> and then I had actually I had divorced and I moved and we were underwater in the house. I'm like, well, that was fun. <laughs> that was yeah. fun. You know, most of it, most of us were. I yeah. know I, I ended up having to short sell my own house in 2012. Yeah, yeah, and, and it was one we bought in two thousand, right at two thousand five, just before when the when the housing market was crazy. I mean, houses mm-hmm. were shooting up seventeen, twenty percent in a in, in a year, and, and that just doesn't happen in a normal market. That's the first sign that something's not right. Something's not okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah when when prices jump that much, uh, the average rate maybe three three to four percent a year in yeah. value in in increase in valuation. Yeah. Um, it concerned me a little bit of what was going on this past few years. Yeah, yeah. here is a mm-hmm. little scary here in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, my parents just got out. They they sold their house off of 32nd Street and Oak for 300000 And um, I think they originally got it around $160,000. So mm-hmm. um, they had a mortgage that they um, had to pay off part of. So, um, but uh, I think the house is still on still on the market it was it was sold to another company for an extra twenty thousand dollars and then um they've cut the price on it and they're they're starting to take a loss because it's starting to turn back around with the way the uh mm-hmm. market is mm-hmm. yeah. yeah good on them for getting out right at the peak though yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're planning on leaving anyway they got so. every penny they could for that yeah thing. <laughs> it kind of worked out well for that so up until about uh, that time period during most of my work during that time period from 19 say 98 through 2009 was still all art reproduction okay and uh, I remember I got a I, I closed the studio and just was doing my own work at that point so I've kind of adapted my own little dark room I've had a dark room pretty much my entire career you know, I guess that's one of the things as photographers, even in my little apartment over at Oasis <laughs> now, yeah. uh, I've modified my five by seven uh, bathroom into a complete dark room where I've got a sink in the shower that is removable <laughs> uh, in a matter of a minute, two minutes. You know, I can take that out, take a shower, put the sink back, and I've got uh, a dark room space in there. And then my other room is still set up with my, uh, my Elwood. You got to meet Elwood sometime. Yeah. I've had Elwood from <laughs> decades uh, and influence all the way back to my dye transfer years. You know, when I worked with Elwood enlargers, uh, they're kind of a unique, uh, a unique enlarger. The one I have is a five by seven. Oh, awesome. And uh, yeah, so that's in my, uh, I, I, I basically, I live in my studio space at, at Oasis. My front room is all my, is all my digital printing area. Back room is where I uh, have my, my futon that I can roll out, and the rest of it is a production area for a darkroom. I'll work. I'll yeah. work. I like that. I'd love to have a live and work space. We don't live too far from the lab, which is nice. But yeah. it yeah. nice sometimes it feels like we live here. It does feel a little <laughs> bit like that sometimes. We haven't spent the night here, so I feel like we're, we're still separated a bit. But. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, the um, the crossover, too, you know, was that, that whole time period of of the of the, the digital – and still incorporating film. And so even to this day, uh, when I closed the studio in 2009, I really did not do a lot of film for a while. Uh, I didn't do much photography at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, there were phases throughout the course of my life. Uh, you know, there's that, that love affair of, of, of photography. And I can tell you there's, I'm not going to go into detail, but there was a couple of periods in the course of my life where I actually put cameras away. And didn't do anything with with a camera for six months, and when I came back, I came back with a whole different, um, a whole different element of vision and appreciation for the craft. Yeah, you know. And that first time was probably when I was living in Eugene, so I was still involved in the film at that time. Yeah, I think that's pretty common with a lot of photographers. You go through lulls. Anyone that like is straight up just doing it nonstop, same thing. I'm like. 
Yeah. You got to have like a little bit of a moment there to take a break and be like, hey. Okay. Absence just, makes the heart grow fonder. It does. Yeah. I was just <laughs> saying that today, actually, because of the cyanotypes. I haven't done any new work in a very long time. And I was like, you know what? I need to get back in that. I'm feeling like the vibe again. Like I want to start doing it again. But it's like, you know, you focus on one thing, focus on another. It's healthy. Mm-hmm. It's good to do that. For mm-hmm. sure. You get a whole new light. As you grow, you get like different perspectives on your work. Well, and I think too that, you know, are we, are, there are some of us that are photographers and it's, you know, we call it quote unquote hobbyists or whatever, but we're serious about our work, but we're not necessarily doing it professionally. Yeah. And, and then there is the professional market. Uh, And in today's requirements, you've almost got to be digital. I'm not saying that there aren't gigs that can't be done with film because there are, but the majority of work is somewhere along the lines, it's going to end up being back to digital. So I think if you're trying to make a career as a young photographer today, it's good to have an interlay between both of those, between Mm -hmm. having the experience with film, but understanding that the majority of probably what you're going to be doing is going to be digitally based for your client base. Um, It's... And like I said, there, there's always those, there's always those fluctuations. You know, there's certainly jobs that can be done on film. Absolutely. But uh, but the requirement is still going to end up going through Photoshop. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Which is a great tool. I mean, let's face yeah. it, it's a wonderful tool. I I, it's, I love it. I love working in Photoshop. What it's. Do you, what do you think of the new AI? Yeah. <laughs> um. I think we need. It's probably just like anything else. Uh, we're going to need to embrace it. Uh, image generation, I'm not sure that you still have to have the photographer's eye involved in, in for me. Okay, and maybe I'm just, just calling me a traditionalist or whatever. But I know there's going to be an area where AI, there's going to be a galleries for people just doing their work in AI. Yeah. But is it really their work? Mm-hmm. That's what I have to question. It's, well, yeah, I can throw the pieces in, but if something else is creating it for me, is it really my work? Yeah. You know, that, that's where I, that's the void that I still uh, have to come for myself. And I think that we're all kind of facing is where is that acceptance level? I know there was a photographer, I think over in Europe somewhere, he entered a contest with an AI generated piece that, um, and he did this specifically to open up the dialogue. Yeah. yeah, and he received an award for the piece, and he rejected the award, and that, and he said, "Look, I can't. I'm not going to accept this award. The whole purpose of me doing the piece was to open up this dialogue about what is valid in photography being done by AI. And you know, if you looked at it, you would have gone. It was a perfectly legitimate shot that could have been done by film or." digitally, mm-hmm. you know, right. that wasn't derived, uh, the composition and such. So it wasn't that challenging, but it still was done by a computer alone. You know? Yeah. And so I have, I have my questions about that. Yeah, it's interesting. It opens up so many doors. So you have folks that are going to be able to create images that, you know, it, they're really good at having the thought of what it should look like in their head but they don't have the skills to make it come alive like Mm -hmm. an artist would. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel like you're going to get this whole new batch of people that are just like, it's opened up a door for them, Yeah, you know, to bring it out. But at the same time, it's like, well, you know, this was computer, but at the same time, it wouldn't exist without that human. (laughs) And then it's like, you know, you have all these people that are working so hard and, you know, to to hone their craft. And then a computer goes around, it's like, bam, done. It's such a weird, like, in between that we're in. It seems like whenever it went from film to digital, it was a little scary, I think, for some people. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you could see the, val- the validity of both. And I think there is a similar to this. But this, I feel like, has so many more questions, like so many different ways that, you know, you're like, well, what if it's used this way and this way? And what's that do? Right. So it's, I'm so curious to see where it's going to go. It's not going to stop. It's going to keep going and get bigger and bigger, but I'm curious, like, Oh yeah, no, we have to embrace it it, because it isn't, it is not going away. It's just like uh, the conversion when uh, digital started taking, uh, uh, replacing Mm -hmm. film uh, uh, commercially. Uh, And and there again, that's, that's where I really want to, I think it, it, it's, commercially and professionally is where 
the change happened, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, because those of us who just wanted to work in film, even if we weren't, you know, working professionally, that's always been there. Yeah. I do remember in 2000, I think it was 2011, uh, I, I used to photograph with either Fuji or uh, Ektachrome uh, tungsten because I use all hot light. I use all hot light uh, technology and uh, technology. There you go. <laughs> Think of that one. Huh? <laughs> it's an oxymoron. Yeah, oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but no, I use all hot lights, which I still use today. As a matter of fact, the 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 lighting system that I'm using and the polarization system that I've got. I bought in 1988 and I'm still using it today. Just have to replace the bulbs, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you take good care of your equipment, it'll, it'll last a long time. Yeah. The, um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, as far as AI is concerned, I mean, I think it's going to be, like you said, Dave, it's, it's a matter of embracing it and how we use it. Um, uh, money's going to drive it, of course. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that as a, uh, a huge factor in its utilization. Um, we're also, um, looking at the art aspect of it and the conflict of, okay, well you had a computer generate something that you would normally have to do manually mm -hmm. or analog. Um, uh, in a sense, you know, it's funny to think of a digital camera as being analog, uh, in the sense that you have to set yeah. up your camera, take your picture. Um, as far as like, uh, I guess not analog, there's a, uh, um, vintage, I guess <laughs> a process. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you don't really need a camera at that point. You yeah. can just tell yeah. the, ca the computer, it. you know, do all these different things. Um, but you know, working in the print industry, we had people that would come in with documents that didn't have bleed uh, built into it. And mm -hmm. so, we had the struggle of having to rebuild their file and it would take hours mm -hmm. and hours to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the beautiful thing with the Photoshop nowadays is you can go in there and do it in less than five seconds. Right. Yeah. It literally the just, yep, they yeah. go, fill it right in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, just, it's try. just automatically does that. And then um, there's other utilizations. I was just leaving work on Friday and one of uh, my coworkers in uh, the digital department, um, pulled me aside when I was talking to him and showed me on his computer, a, a bulldog on the screen. And he's like, check this out. And and he utilized the AI interface to, to show me. Um, and he put a hat on this picture of a bulldog and uh, the lighting on the hat looked great and it looked proper. And then um, he of course pulls up this other image of this dog that's got a chew toy in its mouth, but the dog's face is completely uh disformed and just the the chew toy is like this weird shape <laughs> the lighting looks great but it's just this abomination of right. of uh, uh of this image but um i don't know just it, it's it's interesting to see um just how how things will change over time um and how uh photography as well is going to um i guess evolve with with that yeah Mm -hmm. Is the AI currently, so is it sourcing existing images along with creating images? Is no, it's it? probably, I think it's more sourcing images and so, from, you know, like look at the Google project where, yeah. you know, where you could put a photograph in, you know, yeah. and it would find the image for you, yeah. you know, or, or if you wanted to find out about a piece of artwork, you could mm -hmm. put that image into the search and Yep. It would it would find the info. So I think that's where it's sourcing a lot of it from. So it's sourcing that. So eventually at some point it's going to source from itself. All of our websites. All of the yeah. stuff that's out there, but it's then yeah. it's going to become sourcing from itself. Well, it's it's essentially a database of anything that's connected. So if it has mm -hmm. access to it, then it becomes part of the database. How does that um, become like with copyright and stuff? So it's pulling just random pieces of people's work. Well, there's, that's, that's been a huge conflict right now with AI is that all this artwork that people are producing, you can actually see parts and pieces of it being utilized mm -hmm. in the early stages of AI mm -hmm. uh, because the, the selections that it was pulling from weren't as diverse. And now as things continue to become more and more diverse with the, um, with the selection of different 
different image imagery, um, it's harder and harder to tell that apart. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it it's that's part of the the um, debate right now is is the the copyright and yeah. So know. if you want any work that's truly safe, you just can't put it on the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. If, if referring back to when I was trying the um, uh, the online digital source book, which if I had been able to just carry that through for another five Pin- years, Pinterest, it, it probably would have been a whole different thing. Yeah. <laughs> you just had to come up with Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, no, I can remember when Google and, and Amazon, all of them got started, you know, yeah. because that was the early, that was 1996, 97, yeah. but they all started out of, I think, connections with, uh, uh, Silicon Valley up mm-hmm. in San yeah. Francisco area. Yeah. You know, we were kind of, I mean, let's face it, Arizona is still considered to this day a flyover state. You know, they yeah. fly from LA to New York and uh, back yeah, and it, yeah. it's not, it doesn't land here in Arizona too much. <laughs> um, even now, you know, but I mean, other than the fact that we have all of the stuff that's going on out in Chandler, you know, right. which is probably a Southwest version of mm-hmm. Silicon Valley anymore. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just that that time period, you know, all the AI. Look at Photoshop and how it utilizes it. I mean, yeah, there are some sure. things that are very time saving. I mean, yeah, I could I could go in and have to cut the background out, cut a sky out, but now with it, with Photoshop, you just run a command and it it'll drop ninety percent or ninety five percent. You still have to do a little tweaking, go in and kind yeah. of clean things up, but yeah. you know, it'll draw or, or subject select subject. Yeah. You know, which is kind of cool on the iPhone now, or I don't know how it is. I, I, I use an iPhone. I don't know mm-hmm. how some of the other uh, uh, Samsung and those are handling it. But one of the really trippy things on my 14 is you can put your finger on an image yeah. and move it a little bit <laughs> and copy that. And it only copies that image. And Crops then you can, pa- and yes, and yeah. then you can paste it into just a white background if you want. I mean, or yeah. whatever. And it crops yep. it so well. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. scary. Yeah, it's, it <laughs> yeah. does it so, so well. You're like, oh, wow. Okay. That used to take a long time in Photoshop. <laughs> like, well, and I think all, the, exact, I think all wow. the way back in film, when we would have to be doing that with, uh, if, with Ruby Lith. Which oh, is yeah. uh, RubyLith is simply, um, I know you all know, but just to kind of share that, RubyLith, for those who don't know what it is, is a, a, a plastic sheet with a red plastic base on top of it that would peel off of the sheet. And you would cut out your areas and then peel the area out that you wanted the light to go through. And you're usually working with ortho, well, you're always working with an orthochromatic film at that point which is not sensitive to the red. So the red area would hold back anything. And that's where how you would do uh, the masking that we now do and take for granted uh, in yeah. Photoshop. It's the same method. I mean, that's what you're doing hmm. when you mask out in Photoshop. Think of it. Yep. You look at the black and the white, right? The clear and the, you know, one and the other. That was, uh, if the black area, you just think of that as being red, that's what Ruby list would look like. Interesting. And you were doing that with film. And that was the only way to do it back uh, years ago. Before Photoshop, that's how you did it. Or with the uh, orthochromatic, you could use that as a mask material as well. And uh, like I said, the uh, pan, what was it called? Pan masking, I think it was pan masking uh, uh, negative or film. Pan masking film, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Well, now you just use your thumb. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's kind of crazy how fast digital's going. It's like the first Mm -hmm. digital cameras were not that long ago and they were terrible. And now what we have is like crazy. It's sort of amazing how fast that technology is going. Well, and the integration between film and digital now, you know, if you're still shooting film, uh, many times people are scanning that film, putting it into digital so they can get it. I mean, you're going to put it on Instagram. It's got to go digital. You're going to put it on on your website or you're going to put it some other place. You have to still convert it Mm-hmm. to that process yeah um myself i use it in the reverse a lot of times uh, with my digital photography work i'll use photoshop and then generate uh either um image setter i don't do that too much or uh die you know die uh, uh negatives out of uh, on, on inkjet printers and use that and then contact print my black and whites so it's a reverse, you know, yeah. it's going the opposite direction. Yep. And one yep. of the things I really like about that 
technique for myself, that workflow, when I do that, I still work, you know, I do print from negatives as well, but when I'm working that process is it's all done with contact printing and I can design a negative so that I'm not doing, I'm doing all the burning and dodging before I output the negative. Yeah. And it might take, you know, like I did a piece for somebody that was 30 images, same image, 30 times. It took me probably 12 sheets of 12 runs. I don't do full sheets, but I do little test prints uh, on the digital negative to get the image to where when I finally was going to print it. And they asked me, they go, well, how many sheets of paper did that? did you run? I mean, how many sheets of paper did it take it? Because, you know, when we work in the darkroom from negatives, we might go through four or five prints to get the final print that we really like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one I was able to use for 30 images for them, uh, 33 or 34 sheets of paper because right. everything was consistent. Once I got the negative that I wanted, yeah, it was a seven and a half yeah. second exposure at F8 with, you know, so many inches above the, uh, uh, the paper, contact printed, go in and process it. And it was just one after the other, and there was very, very little shift in um, in in values from one to the other. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. So I do it a little bit differently. You know, that's my workflow with with digital back to negative or back to uh, yeah, we had silver our, or platinum. We had our buddy Ryan Casillas come in and did he did a limited run of prints. We were doing a promotion for a little while, and he dodged and burned. I think it was these small <laughs> four by five, or no, they were five by seven prints that um he was dodging and burning all of them he's like i don't know why i picked this image because <laughs> he had to do it manually we didn't have a we didn't do a contact sheet uh or we didn't do a digital negative we right. um, did it straight from the negative and um you know trying to get that to be consistent was a was a challenge in itself but mm -hmm. uh, the beauty with uh, photoshop is you can do that you so. can do it yeah i do that a lot with cyanotype because cyanotype like i would often take Sometimes it's film that's been scanned mm -hmm. and then adjusted. And sometimes it's cell phones. Sometimes it's digital. Mm -hmm. And then you just adjust it until you get it the way you want it. And then it's contact printing from there. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you can mash it up and go a lot of different ways. It's the di I think all the digital you know, technology is just there as a tool. And AI, I think, is going to end up in the similar bucket where you know, mm -hmm. all this other stuff still going on, but AI exists to assist and help with the stuff, the grunt work, so to say, sure. <laughs> with some of this, you know, but the artistic part of that, I think still going to remain. Yeah. Well, I know you, you think of just the overall uh, craft of photography. And if you're working, let's say, view camera, you know, it might take you three, five minutes to set your camera up, you focus, you slide the shot in, you take the shot. It's, it, that that exposure time, which is the critical part, is only a matter of a, a fraction of a second or a couple of minutes or whatever the length of time is to do the exposure that you need for the reciprocity and such. And that's it. Then we spend all this other time with the physical again, you know, all the steps, the going home and the time to process the film and then to uh, let it dry, contact print it to see what we're going to do and then work it on the negative and all this other stuff. You do it that way or you can do it digitally. And I don't think there's any advantage one way or the other as far as time saving because you still have to do all the steps. Yeah. Yeah. For this one fraction of a second, that was your exposure, the moment you recorded something, you yeah. know? True. Uh, it's so, eh, pick your poison, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's it, it's learning the process too. I mean, if, you know, moving into the future, obviously, you know, learning the digital process would make sense because that's just going to continue to evolve. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there is something about the, uh, the uh, quality of film, the, the handling and the, all the extra stuff um, that uh, that's involved with that. So I think you yeah. get a little bit more satisfaction when it's a little bit more of a hands-on. Oh, At least yeah. I do. That was why I switched over to film because yeah, you know, there's a big difference between just shooting a photo, putting it on your computer, versus like shooting a photo and then you know finding out you didn't shoot your entire roll. <laughs> it's like yeah. I like you know I like that that effort that you have to put in. It's part of the the process is more satisfying i think at least for me for a lot of the work i do the process of it's more satisfying than necessarily the end result even mm. you know it's mm. just like the 
but when you get that pristine print, that, that one it, that, a, that, that's yeah. that's rich and has that luminosity that, that only a, a silver print yeah. will pull, I don't care how close you get it in a black and white digital print, yep. you, yeah. you're, you're missing that one element which is derived from the silver. Mm-hmm. You know? It's very special when you it, get it, one, you're like, oh. It yeah. it really is. It really is, and it's it, it's. I was fortunate in the early years of learning from some very good, um, from Russ, all the way on through. I did some time with. Uh, uh, I did have some interactions with Jay more than I did uh, uh, Fred Summers, or Summer. I, was, I don't know why I was putting that hey. at the end of him. <laughs> um, Fred Summer. But Jay, I had done some work around, and I still, uh, I do know Jay still to this day. So, you know, in fact, I did some E6 processing for him back in uh, the 80s when I had my, my studio uh, set up in Prescott. He would come with some you know, E6 film that he was doing some commercial jobs with. So nice. that's good, yeah. But he was a, he's a hell of a printer, so was, so was Fred. They, and they, they actually, I think Jay, you know, kind of the lineage, Jay learned from Fred. He hmm. was a an understudy of Fred's at one point, I believe. Yeah, interesting. And uh, yeah, but they're both. So from those individuals, and then just a couple of other players throughout the course of my life, I've been blessed to have been taught uh, that element of a really finely crafted black and white silver gelatin print. You know, it's just yeah. and the different steps you can do. Yep. it's it's an art in itself oh absolutely you know and i you know and for myself you were asking a little bit about my my process i don't buy uh pre-packaged chemistry i buy raw chemicals and create all of my developers and have been ever since probably 1978 as far as uh, i i do will work with some film developers but more commonly i use pyrogallic uh, for my film processing uh, not caffeinol. I haven't tried caffeinol yet. It's probably <laughs> similar to pyrogallic. The beauty of pyrogallic, and I will tell you this, if you're, sh- if you're shooting small format film, uh, 35, 120, is with pyrogallic, other than uh, unlike like a D76 or an HC110 or uh, anything, or AC110, um, is it stains the film rather than develops the silver in it. So, Interesting. so you get less of a, you still get grain, but you get less of a sense of grain and a slightly sharper image too with that. Plus it's a, it has a slight yellow cast to it. So mm. it works in the same way as contrast, like when you're in the dark room working under an OC light, right? You can work paper under an OC light and it doesn't get fogged. Mm. The same is true with the pyrogallic uh, on a negative it has kind of that um, chromatic effect to it. So it holds back a little bit. So your, your negatives are still dense, but they don't have to be as dense. Think of a, of a, of a D-Max negative done in D76. You could have maybe half the density in a pyrogallic and probably get even more contrast out of it. Wow. Oh, interesting. Are the chemicals cheaper to buy like uh, that? Uh, yeah, I would say they're more... I don't know about being cheaper, perhaps, but, you know, like I've got, I've been using the hydroquinone that I got from you guys a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you know, that one, yeah. that one pound just lasts for, for, for ages. Yeah. And it, yeah. Uh, they don't go bad as long as you store them properly. I would say that bottle was super old. Yeah. No, it doesn't go, <laughs> yeah. the chemistry doesn't go bad. But, uh, you know, my developers mostly for papers where I do all my own hand uh, crafting of, of my developing solutions. And, and that's really... I would encourage anybody who's seriously uh, um, at that at that point in their black and white careers uh, of at least exploring mixing your own uh, paper developers for sure. Yeah, film. Yeah, it's up to you, but I, I definitely see the advantage. Yeah, you get more control on the whole process. Y- you do. My 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 paper developer is actually a, a two solution developer. One solution's uh, created from hydroquinone and the other is a metol or elon is another term for it, but uh, okay. I use metol. Okay. Yeah, and phenidone is another one too. Yeah. But those are and and they favor particularly different elements of the print. You know, metols are very flat. So one does like highlights, one does shadow like is yeah, if you just not like that clear cut. 
No, not quite. But if you typically, METOL is a little, uh, what I would call a little flatter developer. It it's, um, doesn't necessarily just straight have the contrast range and the blacks. And hydroquinone certainly favors the shadows and, and has a harder time developing the highlights. So if you work those two, I mean, you can get them. And then some people blend them you know, a metal hydroquinone based. And that's what, what much of your package developers are, is a combination of metal, especially your, um, the ones that Kodak used to issue. Uh, I don't, like I said, I don't buy package stuff anymore. I don't even know what's really out there yeah, in the package yeah. developers, but uh, I can almost guarantee you they're going to be a combination of both metal yeah. and hydroquinone. Where do you well, source the chemicals from? Where are you buying? Uh, is that Bosch? Well, yeah, I get some from... Um, uh, Solvent up in in, San, in Santa Fe, and then also uh, uh, what's the other photographer's formulary? And I think they're out of Boise or something. Yeah, are yeah. they used for anything else? Those chemicals or just photography? Uh, the ones that I buy are primarily for photography. They're for photography, yeah, and, and then there is a chemical house here in in Phoenix, over by the airport, that I do buy some of the stuff as well from. Oh, so you can source that. it. Yeah, you can source it. I'll get you the name of that. Oh, group. yeah, that'd be interesting. They They're sell- a scientific. They're a scientific chemistry. They sell. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They sell to the schools. Oh, oh wow! Do they have a storefront? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, they're over, over. They're over on the south side of uh, kind of by University and Twenty Fourth Street, kind of in that area. I'll get you. Oh, I'll get you. Yeah, because it's address. really expensive sometimes to get some of this stuff shipped with the biohazard or not biohazard, but the what do you call it the hazard yeah yeah yeah. some of the you have to pay extra for some of that some of it you can't it's very hard to get yeah i had to get some hydrogen peroxide 30 percent recently and it was really expensive (laughs) to get it It that would be the place to go and they also sell all kinds of um beakers and anything in the science because they they uh market to the schools so any of the chemistry departments in schools are typically buying uh they're they're a source for them so they have all that material oh we definitely have to get that name yeah. we'll post that up too so people know that that's there because i think there's probably a lot of people and it's a it's a that. father and no son idea that existed it's a father and son that run it the father started it years ago and the son kind of uh, runs it now nice nice so yeah great group of people well we'll have to we'll have to have you on for another episode we'll do yeah. a deep dive in uh uh processing and yeah. and uh considering kodak is is you know mm-hmm. shutting down their their plants and um uh, for for chemistry uh, people are going to need a different, uh, diff- go a different direction for creating their developers. Yeah, uh, so, absolutely. Um, are they, is that happening with the E6 and stuff? Or there's, a, there's another company that's doing E6, right? Um, the there's E6. other companies out yeah. there that are doing E6. Um, yeah. I know Arista, um, uh, Cinestill has their chemistry. Um, there's there's a variety of companies out there. Roli, um, Bellini in Italy, um, or Europe rather. Um, but for whatever reason, Codex, um, uh, the lab that they source their chemistry from is shutting down. So, hmm. uh, or has shut down and now they're basically selling through a lot of their stuff. So Dectol, D76, HC110 are all pretty much discontinued at this oh, point. We've been hoarding a so little bit. I just ordered a bunch, but I'm probably going to order more. <laughs> oh yeah. But there are, so, there are the formulations for those things out there. Yeah. yeah so, so you can formulate I, D76 very easily. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Dectol, same thing. Dectol is probably metol and hydroquinone yeah. uh, mixture, you yeah. know, with sodium sulfite and uh, either potassium or sodium carbonate. And then whatever they use as a restrainer, probably, I would imagine it's probably potassium bromide, but it might be benzotriazole. I don't know. One of those two. Do you have recipes for a lot of this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I'll, I'll turn you on to a couple of books. There's some great resources out there of, of books that people can buy, uh, I'm sure, used somewhere. Yeah. They can source them. You bet. I think a lot of people would love to have some, like, I think that's the big part. Like, well, where do I get the stuff and how do I put yeah. that together? It's so much easier just to buy the bottle and be like, here, here, this is what it is. But it is. to have like a nice, simple recipe of like, hey, this is exactly what it needs. And this is where you source it from. Just to have that as, you know, something we can put together would be amazing. Yeah. And I've got a notebook of materials that, uh, you know, over the years of recipes that I've worked with that I know are tried and true now. That, that, yeah. That'll, yeah. And I'm happy to share those with you as well. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Dave's sure. Dave's secret recipes. Dave's secret recipes. <laughs> I think you should put a cookbook together, like there a photography is. cookbook yeah. of like all the different. Yeah, that'd be kind of amazing. I don't know if anyone's done that yet, but you should put a cookbook oh, together. Yeah, there is. Oh is yeah, there? there's oh there's a number of them out there. You bet. Yeah, won't be as good as yours though. No, oh. room for, there's room for more. <laughs>
<laughs> it's just life experience, yeah. Southwestern uh, cooking with Dave. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Something like that. Well, I appreciate you being on the show, Dave. Um, Thank you very much. It's, uh, been, it's been enjoyable. I want to chat more. I feel like it's, uh, I know, yeah. we just got started. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So I guess like, where are you going now? What's your, what's, what's Dave up to right now? What, what should be? I'm, I'm, I've retooled my, my uh, website. It's just about ready to be released. It's actually going to have an online store with it. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm working both. I still do uh, work commercially. Uh, that would be probably again the artwork and then portraiture. Awesome. What's your uh, website? What's the? It's going to be. I'll I'll get that to you. It's uh, basically double D urban photo, and then it's at iteraart.com. So it's a sub it's a subdomain of my okay. main itera art uh, okay. website. And both of those are not active at the moment. They will be within the next week. Awesome. 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 They'll be back up. Well, we'll get this episode up before the end of the month, and. Yeah. Uh, We'll, we'll include all those in the notes uh, on the podcast, but uh, um, really awesome having you on, uh, talking more with you and learning more about uh, your history and um, just stuff that, you know, we don't really think about these days. Uh, that, that was the the way things were done back then. <laughs> yeah, it was. It say, I mean, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, it's, you know, I mean, photography has got its long heritage and changes. Yep. You know, we're not doing, well, there are those who are doing 10 types, but it's not common anymore. You know? yeah. 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 There's, there's a few, it's there's a few a, things here and there. Jump, I think it is. That. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. seen a lot more of those pop up. No, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a novelty yeah. now and it's a, if, um, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully not just a phase, but I mean, there are people that are exploring all of those historical processes, yeah, is, but yeah. in, but in question of what you, you know, kind of wrapping up or closing on what we were talking about with AI. Yeah. Uh, I can think of a great line from uh, Martin Scorsese when somebody asked him about uh, the digital in creating movies now. And he was fine with it. He's like, you know, yeah, film is wonderful. And doing film, there's nothing like it. Doing a movie right. in film. Right. But this is the way of the future. Yeah. So we as, to, as directors need to accept it, you yeah. know, and, and, and again, exploit that medium for what it is. Yeah. I think that's the key as a photographer. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank that's you. A, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Thank we you appreciate so it. And uh, we'll catch you again on uh, yeah, uh, another, another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere down the road. Yep. And then just a reminder to listeners to please, you know, like, um, you know, share our podcast out there. We're still yeah. growing our base. So definitely share it out there too. Oh, you guys like, have done some far. great, some great pods already. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we've had some great people. Uh, and yeah. that fellow that you brought down that was here from, um, was it, was Atlanta? he from, no, uh, no, he's from up, was Wisconsin? he from Michigan or, or Ohio. Oh, that's right. Ohio. 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 I think it was Ohio. Was yeah. it Ohio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. John, John was, uh, he was good on the podcast. Fun, fun guy to chat with. Yeah. It was about like two months back. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. He was here in March yep, or was, April. Was, yeah, yeah. He, he came to visit. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. That was a great podcast. Yeah. And and the one you just recently did. Um... With Lucinda. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lucinda was a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm excited that we'll be interviewing uh, Everett Malloy yeah, here pretty soon. Oh, that's, yeah. that'll be yeah. fun. So, we have Everett. I think this week we're... Hoping to get him on the calendar. Um, I think we've got our, our setup dialed in now, so we don't have to worry too much about uh, errors like we had before. <laughs> yeah, technically, we, we recorded a podcast with Dave once before, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, it didn't record part of the voices. <laughs> yeah. so, no, this is quite this good. Is it, I think this you guys have it dialed in and it, you know, just listening on the headphones. Really yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. But we'll have, uh, we'll have some more guests coming on, and uh, we definitely want to get that podcast uh, to get it out there, get it growing. Uh, we just had a giveaway. Um, which ends at the end of this month, the uh, end of June. Mm-hmm. So um, definitely want you guys to participate in that if you haven't already. Um, and uh, that's our last giveaway podcast is the title. Um, uh, you can win free film, uh, T-shirts, uh, workshops, a uh, bunch of different things. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll have more more podcasts on the way. Uh, we also have a Patreon. So patreon.com backslash or forward slash uh, PHX Film Revival. And uh, you can support us there online uh, financially. It's a couple bucks, $5 a month. You, 
there's a tier. We also have a $10 a month tier as well. Um, and uh, we'll be making some adjustments there and posting more content. So um, again, thank you guys so much for your support and uh, we'll chat with you again soon.